Today's episode of Rates and Barrels is brought to you by the SoFi Daily Podcast. Did you know 37% of Americans would struggle to cover an unexpected $400 expense? April is National Financial Literacy Month, which means it's time to expand your financial knowledge. And that all starts with having the right information. For facts, analysis, and updates related to markets and financial awareness, listen to the SoFi Daily Podcast every weekday. Search for SoFi wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Monday, March 29th, opening day, just a few days away. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris on this episode. We dig through some pretty interesting roster decisions around the league. Some very fun young players have won roster spots. Uh, we have some other interesting things to get to, including a co-closer situation in Cincinnati. Some helpful late draft season advice if you have not drafted yet if you got a draft coming up here in these next couple of days we got something that might help you out Uh, closer runs are getting worse looking back at some of the weekend drafts we'll talk about how to handle that and we'll take a look at some first week observations with four days coming up this week it's a little bit of a different sort of week to get us started so before we get there how's it going for you on this monday you know good good i've got two drafts today just trying to finish it out one is the uh is one last one on nfbc uh rotowire um and it's not full yet so i think i gotta pimp it and make sure that it gets full the last one i was signed up for on friday just didn't even fill so i want that one to fill and then i've got my pitchfork league what up pitchfork or former pitchforkers almost all of them have left pitchfork at this point uh but uh, i've got to come up with my brian eno based team name uh, at some point got to be got to be something there with otani i've got otani as a keeper uh there's got to be an otani brian Eno name i just got to figure it out we did get a response to the who is today's brian Eno, so i'll just throw that out there ones. right now yeah one suggestion was ryan tedder his solo work is pretty good through one republic his production work is littered with chart toppers in support of your inbox zero mission and recognizing this email is behind the pod discussion by a week uh, I'll give you just the wiki link if you're interested in more information. Here's the short list. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Adele, J-Lo, Kelly Clarkson, Carrie Underwood, and yes, even the Lowly Island. Yes, that is, uh, that's an impressive resume. So That's a pretty good one. Uh, I, I don't know. Does he perform as well? Um, there was that component for Brian Eno that he was on, often on stage too. Um, so I don't know if that fits. One that does fit that I like, uh, and I guess I'm just pimping it because I like the music, but uh, Danger Mouse. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think that I knew. Uh, let me look this up here. I don't think that I knew uh, everybody he worked with because he works with um, some rock that I just didn't uh, didn't know. What was the rock band that I was I was sort of surprised? Uh, zero seven gorillas. I knew, um, CeeLo, they were Nars, Bar- Nars Barkley, that CeeLo one. That was pretty good. Um, but here he did a Paris Hilton album. Hmm. That's, That's weird. weird. <laughs> uh, but you know, Brian, Eno was pretty weird. Ah, he did a black keys album. Hmm. Well, yeah, and, and Dan and Auerbach Beck, was was suggested as a, a, a Brian Eno. Yeah. I like that Beck, suggestion. That spoke to me. Sparkle Horse. Danger Mouse and Sparkle Horse present Dark Knight of the Soul. Well. Oh, Broken Bells. That was the name I was surprised. I did not know that he worked with Broken Bells. So that's pretty that's pretty wide, right? From yeah. from Broken Bells to CeeLo. <laughs> yeah. So our search continues, but we've got some candidates for sure. Thanks to uh, David for the email. Oh, the, and the last Tedder. one was Ronson. Oh, Mark Ronson? Sort, sort of obvious. Mark Ronson, sort of yep. obvious. I would have to say, though, I don't think that the um, Mark Ronson, and, and, I, and I'm going to offend somebody here because <laughs> people really love Mark Ronson. Uh, Mark Ronson, to me, uh, is someone who takes something that's been done before and does it again. <laughs> sorry wow i mean just listen to some of the stuff like he's in trouble he's gotten in trouble for this like he's been in court repeatedly for stealing for stealing riffs and if just listen if you listen to the uh look up the one what's the sort of funky one he did with um uptown funk who's who's that with bruno mars go and give it to you yeah 
Bruno Mars. That one, if you if you listen, if you listen, there's a there's a there's a there's a, a lawsuit out there. If you listen to the other one, you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, what I mean, like this is this is on the level of uh, of Vanilla Ice being like, no, it's dumb, 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 da da dumb, dumb. Oh, that's one of the best defenses <laughs> it's of very different of all time. Like Vanilla Ice <laughs> defending that riff is like on the same level as the Chewbacca <laughs> defense in South Park. Elite, elite defense. What was that? The Chewbacca defense? What was the South Park one? Uh, I'm not even no. going to, I'm not going to do the Chewbacca defense on the pod. Uh, People uh, will tune out immediately, but it, that's up. worth, that's worth your <laughs> YouTube searching. Uh, but we're here to help people out. Last minute drafts, of course. And uh, young players getting some opportunities is where I wanted to start today's show. Jazz Chisholm wins the second base job in Miami. Isan Diaz goes to AAA. Uh, I do like this as a kind of a late draft season, add him to the bottom of your rankings and, and push him up a little bit if he was already there kind of play because Jazz Chisholm has some flaws. He swings and misses a lot, but there's power, there's speed, and I think he's the kind of player that could just take the job and run with it. We saw him when he reached double A for the first time in 2019, carry a double digit walk rate throughout that season, uh, 21 homers, 16 steals in 20 attempts as a 21 year old. And he's the kind of guy that had we seen a minor league season in 2020, he might've done some pretty impressive things at the triple a level and probably would have played even more in Miami than he did. He saw 21 games with the Marlins a year ago. Projections are really low on him because he hit 161 with a 242 OBP in his brief big league debut. But what is your interest level in Jazz Chisholm given that power speed combo? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm furiously looking up his strikeout rate in the spring. <laughs> uh, let's see here 13 strikeouts in 41 ABs. Hey, that's not bad. Uh, 45 yeah. ABs. That's really good for him. 13. I had, oh, that's not that good. <laughs> it's good for him. Uh, 29%. <laughs> see, I had to break out the calculator for that. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's almost one third, you idiot. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, the strikeouts are a problem. Um, you know, he's hit 268 this spring, but I'd have to assume that the BABIP is really high. Uh, because he struck out so often. Um, the walk rate, I guess, is okay. And that's good to see. I just think he'll be a guy, he could be a guy that threatens 2020 plus uh, on both sides and doesn't have an average over 200. And I just wonder how long they're going to run a guy out like that. Ruggenet Odor got a lot of run for being like a below average hitter that was great for fantasy. I actually see a little bit of accomplishedness there, hmm. you know, but maybe more, more defense from jazz. If, if so, I guess if he plays good, good enough defense, then maybe he'll stay out there. I always thought birdie was going to take that job. I kind of saw birdie and Miguel Rojas as the veteran glue guys that move as soon as they decide they want to play a younger player. And, that's the right way to go about it if you're the Marlins. But I think the key difference for me, though, looking back at Ruggie Odor's minor league numbers, he didn't strike out as much as Jazz does, but he didn't walk as much either. And I think when you play good defense and you draw walks, you can avoid some of those just horrific slumps where you're carrying a 275 OBP for a few weeks. You know, So that, I think, does keep the playing time afloat for Chisholm. And I do think because of the depth they have, if he struggles enough, they're not going to let him stay at the big league level if he's hitting 190, right? If he's hitting 190 with a 295 OBP, he's going down when there's a minor league season and when there are AAA games to play in. If he's good, they'll just keep playing him. And they'll say, hey, great, yeah, we called him up and he's he's good enough and we're just going to play him and awesome. We're, we, we've are we figured out what we're doing in our middle infield with at least one spot. I also think he's a good enough defender where at some point he could move back over and play shortstop again too. A lot of guys that get moved over to second base it's because they really can't play anywhere else on the infield. In Chisholm's case, I think it's just the best possible configuration with what they have right now, but he could still end up back over there. You're on mute. <laughs> there you go. Monday, Monday. Uh... <laughs> um, I was on mute. 
Uh, no, um, Miguel Rojas is a regression candidate. And uh, honestly, I don't know if he's a, do you think he's a, do you know, you know, like, you know, the term first division starter, right? Like, yes, I do. Sorry. I've been around baseball for a while. <laughs> a baseball adjacent. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, first division starter. Uh, I don't think he's a first division starter. No, he's not. He's definitely not that. Yeah, so, so Jazz could, could should move over there if he if he finds enough. Um, but it's not like I guess uh, Birdie is actually a league average player. I think he's just old and uninteresting. Right. He could fall apart quickly, but you could justify not playing him every day very easily. It's just you're not going to sweat it if you're not putting John Birdie in your lineup six days a week. If he's in there three days a week, coming off the bench to their games, that's just fine. I think we got to look at a quick would you rather, you know, so people that would have late drafts, rather? they can make this call Mauricio Dubon or Jazz Chisholm mm. as an MI option. I'm going to wiggle off the the hook here. Uh, I think there's. Uh, you're not going to let me. <laughs> no, you you're probably going to do it successfully. We'll see. Uh, I'm just saying that there's uh, there's different situations where I'd want a different each one. If I it's not if it's like a weekly lineup situation or like a like a league where I'm just looking for a guy who will start for me all the time. Um, I think I would rather take the shot at Jazz and put him on my bench. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but if it's a daily lineup situation where um, I'm going to plug and play and actually use the guy on the bench a lot, I'd rather have Dubon. Because I okay. think his usage will be predictable. His ceiling is not as high, uh, but his day-to-day -day utility is higher. Okay. Uh, let's try one other one. Let's say... Jazz Chisholm versus Kevin Newman, who's going to play a lot for Pittsburgh, had a nice batting average in 2019, double-digit homers and steals that year. So you're not taking on quite the same batting average risk, but I think it's probably fair to say both the power and the speed are more suspect with Newman than they are with Jazz Chisholm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of the same idea, though. Uh, the ceiling is higher on jazz. So if you're chasing ceiling, go for jazz. Uh, Newman though, uh, you know, had a good spring, found a, a certain swing again. And I, uh, I take him over Dubon. I think he'll hit uh, 280 and go like 15, 15 or something. Be pretty useful. Yeah. That'd be really nice for Kevin Newman. He's been, he's been free in drafts. I mean, at least Dubon, you're drafting him inside the top 300 overall. So I think if you do want jazz Chisholm, you're probably drafting him, right around the back of the top 300. That's what it's going to take to get them just because people are going to see the power and speed and chase it. Obviously have that batting average cushion already built in because that's going to probably be his worst category almost indefinitely. But if he hits 230 or 240 and walks enough, he could actually end up higher in the batting order. The runs could be there. The RBIs could be there. I think the power and speed will be there sooner rather than later. Uh, let's get to Taylor Trammell. He's going to start the year in the outfield in Seattle. We thought this might be possible back when Jared Kelnick's uh, service time conversation last happened on this show. Um, so not a total stunner that Trammell is up, but I think probably a more exciting player than you ordinarily get for a, a prospect traded multiple times. Uh, like Jazz Chisholm, this is a guy that can draw a lot of walks. He's shown some speed in the upper levels of the minors, including 20 steals and 28 attempts at double A as a 21 year old in 2019 uh, batting average was a bit of a concern that year. But again, if you walk enough, get a little power. Trammell has that. I think you could end up seeing Taylor Trammell play his way into a somewhat prominent spot in the Seattle lineup. So it's kind of a, an open audition for him to prove that he's ready as a big leaguer here in the first few weeks of the season. Yeah. I don't know, man. 33% strikeout rate in the spring. Projected to strike out 30% of the time. It's going to be pretty hard for him to have the OBP you need. He's going to have to really hit the snot out of the ball so that he has like a 330 BABIP. Uh, he's going to have to walk more than 10% of the time. And that will get him to like a 250, 320. Um 
maybe 400. He's pretty borderline, dude. I yeah. think I think what ends up being uh, he ends up being a fourth outfielder for them because I think he can play enough center. So I think part of that too is just the fact that they've got you know, Kyle Lewis already there, Kelnick just around the corner, and Julio Rodriguez mm-hmm. not that far behind. And eventually, if you don't have anybody that you permanently right into the DH spot, you can get all four of those outfielders playing time together if Tremel's hitting enough. And if he's not, you're right. Backup outfielder is fine. I just saw this on his Fangraphs page, actually. They're uh, one-liner on Trammell. It's not a sexy left-field profile because of the lack of power, but Trammell is in the Brett Gardner mold, OBP in defense. I mean, that's not a bad player. It's just a question of how quickly he gets there. If he's Brett Gardner two years from now, he's not going to help you a lot in the interim. If he's that player right away, he ends up being one of those great early pickups that actually proves to provide a ton of value, especially if the bags are there. Yeah, if he's striking out 33% of the time, even if he's walking, it's not going to be a high OBP. <laughs> so, yeah, they needs to, he needs to improve the contact rate. And uh, so I'm not reaching out. You know, most of these names that we're talking about, like, I, I didn't... Uh, I, we did the first week of uh, free agency auction bidding and whatever. And like, I didn't pick up any of these guys. Really? Uh, well, this guy, next guy wasn't available in a lot of leagues. Alejandro Kirk made the opening day roster for the Jays. And I kind of did a 180 on him because when draft season started, I was skeptical they were actually going to let him be their DH right away. They added pieces. It got really crowded. Anyway, you look at the situation now. Danny Jansen's not great. He's good enough to be a big league catcher but he's not necessarily good enough to block a player you really like in an organization. And I think it's become increasingly clear to me that Alejandro Kirk is a guy that this organization really likes. And of course he popped in the stat cast numbers. That's why people liked him this draft season, even when I didn't. And it looks like the playing time is opening up just a little bit. Do you think we're going to get to the point where Kirk is playing enough to actually be relevant in single catcher leagues? Two catcher leagues, of course, sure. If he was available this weekend, he was picked up. If he's still available in your league in a two catcher league, he's going to get picked up now for sure. But is he a top 12 catcher because of what we saw with the low strikeout rate and the hard contact that he was making in his debut a year ago? By plate appearance, I think he's the second best catcher in baseball and in projections offensively. So, yes, I would actually pick him up. I'd pick him up now in a 12 team. If he's, if he's, if he's available, I'd pick him up. I'd want him on my team. I would think that um, this first, this first week will tell you a lot, you know, and the the guy that you're dropping, who's a back end top 12 catcher, you can probably get back. (laughs) Yeah. One catcher leagues, the catcher pool does flatten out quite a bit. So if you're disappointed in Kirk's playing time, I'd probably give it, the shortened week plus a full week at the very yeah. least, just to see the Jays sort of tip their hand with who he's catching and how often he's playing. If you get to the end of the full second week and he's still not playing enough, you can go out and get Jorge Alfaro or Jan Gomes or you know, somebody will be there. Omar Narvaez, if he's off to a good start in Milwaukee, will have moved up, right? There's going to be Stassi's somebody probably, available. Stassi's available and you know how much Stassi is playing too. Right you'll see how healthy he is and and how much playing time he's actually going to share with Kurt Suzuki. So I do think that chance is worth taking. It's amazing the projections like him that much because it's like the opposite of what we normally see. Like a projection for a prospect who comes up and struggles comes out extremely light. For a prospect like that who comes up and thrives on a really limited sample size, it actually pops. But I think a big, big part of that is the low K rate. And that's a skill that he's had everywhere he's been. So I don't think that's a fluke. There's, it's not only the the small sample MLB stuff. It's that his numbers in the minors were so good in such key categories that even if you regress them, they're still good. <laughs> you know, like this dude in the minor leagues basically walked 15% of the time and struck out less than 10% of the time. That's like Mookie Betsian. Honestly, that's Mookie Betsian. That's what Mookie Betts' strikeout and walk totals look like. And in fact, with the strikeout, with the with the power too, like some of his power numbers look better than Betts' power numbers did in the minors. I'm not saying Alejandro Kirk is Mookie Betts. <laughs> good point. Good, good to clarify. You could almost that. fit two Mookie Betts in an Alejandro Kirk. But that's no, see, not these days. He lost a lot of weight. But that's part of the thing too. Is I, I wonder how much Kirk's unusual physique has played into 
how he's been evaluated and how he's been written up and how people have thought about him, right? He's been, I think, probably overlooked because of, of his body type. Yeah, I mean, especially a catcher, you'd think that that wouldn't be a big deal, but that was part of the problem with Mookie Betts is everyone saw his size and didn't think he had the power. Yeah, so I'm excited that he's on the roster because I at one point thought they would mess around with service time a little bit, try and keep it afloat. They didn't need a lot of offense from their catcher spot given what they've done everywhere else, but they're doing the thing where they actually are playing him. And I think he's at least getting half the time, but he's probably got a shot to pretty quickly take over the bulk of the starts behind the plate over Danny Jansen. Uh, This one in Cleveland is one that I was wrong about. Logan Allen ends up winning the number five starter job over Cal Quantrill. Quantrill is going to go to the bullpen for now. And Allen's going to start the fourth game of the season. And I think when we've looked at Logan Allen in the past, I remember the velo, I think, was the biggest concern. It's the low velo guy that doesn't necessarily have a great secondary offering. Has anything changed? I mean, it's the changeup is his best secondary. So you don't have a good swing and miss breaking ball. At least we haven't had one so far. Has anything changed for you that would get you to pick up Logan Allen? Well, one thing that he did uh, have, uh, and he managed to coax, I think, the most out of his slider uh, as he could uh, with this, is that he had good slider command. And um, I think that that's part of the package that they look for. I mean, if you look at it, Quantrill and Logan Allen, both the guys they got from the Padres, both had decent slider command. Um, And I think that's a good place to start, especially since uh, my research found uh, some indication Indication that slide that slider com- the command was more important than stuff for the slider. Uh, it's 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 baseball's new fastball is the slider. So I I think that that foundation of good command uh, on the slider and good command in general is going to uh, is going to be good for him. Good slider command, good changeup. If there's any, if there's been any, I'm sorry that we just don't seem to have. Um, velo across the board i really wish we did for for everybody in in spring but uh i don't know that i've i've seen a report for uh alan's velo this spring no i've lived the life of doing verified twitter searches trying to find velo updates and trying to get clarity on things like this and more often than not you come up with nothing for the same reasons that you know we're we're not able to just look it up ourselves but uh definitely a hole in spring numbers that will be filled very quickly, right? It's only going to take a couple of starts, two or three starts before you can say, okay, he's picked up a tick on the fastball or he's same as he was before. Or he's lost something. Uh, but I just thought this was surprising because for me, Quantrill had better stuff going into draft season. And even if the results were going to favor Allen and cactus league games, I thought Quantrill was going to be the guy in Cleveland. He still could be. There could be an injury. He could get an opportunity later. But I don't think you're holding Quantrill in a mixed league waiting for that opportunity. You're just going to go pick him up later if that opportunity actually arises. So I think just because of what Cleveland's been able to accomplish with similar talent in the past, it's kind of a no-brainer to put Logan Allen into your plans for at least deeper mixed league. I don't know if you want to pick him up in 10 and 12 teamers. 12s Maybe he's more schedule dependent for a two-start week. Absolutely. For a favorable streaming spot, definitely rosterable. But I don't know if he's necessarily a guy that you're picking up in a 12-teamer and saying, all right, Logan Allen's on my roster for the rest of the season, and he's going to be in my lineup for most of the starts. He's probably not quite at that level yet. I bought him in uh, a few leagues on NFC. Like uh, I think I bought him TG FBI. I think I bought him um, in both my leagues on the NFPC. And the reason is I think he's their opening day starter. So uh, the one thing that I just most recently read, though, uh, on our site, I think, uh, was a breakdown of how the starting rotation is going to work. And uh, they were like, well, anybody not named uh, Plesak, Bieber, or Savali is going to be in a mix. So they were like putting everything on the table where uh, Allen is an opener and McKenzie is a follower or McKenzie is just a bulk reliever that follows Allen or... Uh, Quantrill's is everybody's bulk reliever. So, um, but it seems like just Allen and McKenzie are ahead of Quantrill for whatever reason. And 
there is actually no, there is signal in spring training numbers. Dan Rosenhack did a big piece on this where he found signal in spring training numbers. The problem is that I think we all often look at like ERA and batting average, and that's not where signal is in small samples. I mean, if you're listening to this, you know that those aren't great numbers for, for looking in small samples, but strikeout rate is pretty decent for pitchers. And uh, strikeout, we know that strikeout minus walks is one of the most powerful small sample numbers we have for uh, for uh, for pitchers. And it was just better for, for Allen. He just had a better strikeout minus walk rate. And, you know, if you're looking to make a decision in spring, that's going to be one of the number one places you'll look. Last question then related to spring and job battles. Randy Dobnik, it looks like, is going to be in the bullpen for now for the Twins, just signed a five-year extension he wasn't going to reach free agency until 2026 but he had a great spring k to bb was outstanding it may only be a matter of time given some of the pitchers they've got in that rotation jay happ is old michael pineda has been hurt a lot matt shoemaker unfortunately has been hurt a lot as well so even if dobnik isn't starting at the beginning of the season it may only take a couple of weeks before he gets that opportunity but skills wise i think you could almost make an argument that he's a better option than Matt Shoemaker because even though Shoemaker's numbers on a per inning basis have been pretty good around all the injuries the last few years, you want a guy who actually goes out there every fifth day and at least gets you four or five innings. And I think Dobnik could actually do that. So I'm discouraged that he's not like written into the rotation right away. But I think compared to someone like Quantra, who's a really tough hold, you can try and talk yourself into holding on to Dobnik for just a little bit to see how it plays out. Yeah, actually, I've 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 lost I've dropped Quantrill shares, but I've retained my Dobnak shares, and I think he's a pretty good. I mean, he's he's um, it's a little bit more of a binary situation for Dobnak. I think where someone will get hurt and he will replace them. Whereas the Indians sound like they're playing games; they're playing almost like raise games. They haven't in the past. The Indians used to leave their starters in, but I think that's once they discover who their guys are, they're willing to leave them in. Um, whereas, uh, right now they have like six guys and, or seven guys and they're just w- willing to sort of mix and match. I think the twins will have five. And when they, when someone is out, Dobnak will be in that five. So I, I kind of think that'll happen soon enough. And I, I wonder if Dobnak will have some value vulturing wins, mm-hmm. uh, coming in, in the fourth and fifth four guys like Shoemaker and Pineda. Pineda is a two pitch pitcher. He is a he is the guy you never want to see the third time through the order. So Pineda, I would want out often in the fourth. And if you can just come in, Dobnak can come in and pitch five outs there. That's an easy way to get a win. Yeah, could be one of those guys that if he were a reliever all year, which I don't think he will be, he'll be in and out of the rotation, could win seven or eight games just as a reliever based on the usage, the quality of the team and when he's actually getting those opportunities. So I just thought Dobnik was worth mentioning mentioning because he had a great spring and because he's a more of a hold than a drop. I mean, Josh Lindblom also kind of fits in this. They are not using him as a starter right now. I would say he's closer to Quantrill where when he gets the opportunity to start again, I'm interested then, but I'm not necessarily trying to hold on to him roster. quite the same way as Dobnik. Yeah, it's just, it's a roster. Because you're betting on, thing. you're betting on, with Lindblom and Quantrill, you're betting on a little bit of growth. Dobnik has shown us that he can be good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think part of that great spring was that he has a new slider. So I think that the floor is higher on Dobnak and I think the ceiling is maybe there. I I'd probably take a Lindblom or Quantrill ceiling over Dobnak, but, uh, the, the, the floor matters in the meantime, because you got to keep the guy around. You want to think that you could at least throw him in there, maybe get a relief win and survive an, a zero. Like it, it's really important. Like when, if you're doing free agency auction bidding, right, you don't want to push like I think I made this mistake in the first week. I bought Jake Arietta as a streamer, but I bought him for like uh, twenty three bucks. I think that's too much for a streamer because you got to think about it. You got to do this over and over again. Twenty three bucks in, in in if you're talking hundred is like two bucks, but th- th- that still be a lot to I think spend on a streamer because you're gonna want to have a big buy at some point where you buy some big bat for some reason, right? Yeah, I mean, what it took, though, anyway, to get Arietta in some leagues um, was that $23 bid. It varied a lot because some people believe in him and some people don't. But it's two starts. It's two starts against the Pirates. So it's streaming right. for two weeks. So it's, I don't think that's a bad bid necessarily. Uh, I do think typically a one-off streamer could go for less than that with a $1,000 budget. But 
You but check this out. I had a higher number and Randy Dobnak convinced me. He called me up. He convinced me. He convinced me that uh, uh, I should put a lower number on Jake. And I'm happy for that because I got Jake and I got him at the lower number. Uh, but the reason was, well, worst case scenario, I'll put Dobnak in and maybe I'll relief ultra win. He'll probably pitch. You know? Yeah. So uh, it's nice sometimes to have a guy with a high floor on your bench so that you don't spend all your money in free agency auctioning right off the bat. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the way my mind works, I think too much about the entire season because we spend all draft season looking at full season projections and thinking about full season performance. And then we get to the first fab or even the first couple fabs and we cling to those guys that we're expecting to have the great season or guys that are expected to get that opportunity. And that's why for years I had too many players I was stashing. That was my biggest flaw when I started playing NFBC a few years ago was being too optimistic about prospects getting called up, part-time guys becoming full-time guys, and IL guys. I just had way too much playing time downside on my bench, especially in 15-team leagues. Oh, um, man. You, you need playing time. And, and to, to have playing time always available, my process for fab is completely different than it used to be. I look at every single spot on the roster before I start bidding, and I think about number of games and what the playing time has been like recently. And if I feel like I've got a playing time weakness that I can't cover by moving players around, I'm looking for someone who's playing a lot. I'm thinking about who's playing a lot more than the best available player. And the reason why I'm thinking about it that way is because I'm still going to think about the best available player. I'm going to get to the top prospect that got called up or the new closer. But I want to make sure I'm not so excited to get the shiny new toy that I might not even need in that particular roster that I'm overlooking the smaller holes that are actually very apparent. So it's just sort of like knowing my own tendency to, to chase the big bids and fab. That's all fine. Look at what you need first. You will find that, Oh, actually picking up Colin Moran for a dollar is the best thing I can do for my 15 team T 15 team league for this week, because He's got a bunch of righties and he's going into Baltimore and their pitching's bad. And that's a good park. And I need corner infield at bats. Like that kind of stuff makes a huge, huge difference. Colin Moran's not sexy. He's not ranked high in the rankings. He's not a guy that I'm going to hold on to all the time, but you have to think about getting through each week. And even I would say, look, maybe one week ahead too, because if you start looking one week ahead of the current week, you could save some money on two start pitchers, especially you can save a little money on some of the hitters. They're going to end up maybe going into a place like Colorado. And it's good to save that fab because you are right. You're going to want to have money available later. And if you're overpaying all the time for everything, you're going to get outbid from about June on, on just about everything you need. Yeah. Two thoughts uh, spring out of that discussion was really interesting. I agree with you. It's something I've had to learn. Um, and so one thing I did, um, this on the Sunday night was drop a fair amount of Alec Mills shares. And I'm, I'm here to publicly apologize to all of you for the Alec Mills helium. Um, <laughs> I, I will eat my crow. I'm sorry. The numbers looked right. I do think that he's a six start and he'll be, he'll be, he'll, he'll be in there. He's in this sort of Quantrill grouping of like interesting six starters that will still matter. And so hopefully we will still have our day. Alec Mills, you and I. Still have our day in the sun someday, but it's not now. And so I, I pick up a share like Jake Arrieta and drop a drop a share like Alec Mills because it's just not going to be that useful for me in the short term. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about was that there is a tension. You're talking about wanting to have uh, money later. There is a tension between mm, hoarding FAB, like hoarding uh, auction, like hoarding free agents. If you have moves, hoarding your moves, hoarding your, your, your auction for free agency. There is a, there is like a tension between that and um, the, the earlier you get a real asset. Like if you get an every down back kind of idea, right? Like you get an actual starter at your position um, early in the season, you get a lot more value out of that than if you waited and hoarded that money and you were waiting for the, 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 uh, the trade deadline. And then the trade deadline, as it often is, was underwhelming. And you hoarded all that money to pick up a guy that's only going to play for you for two months when in the first auction of the year, 
you might have picked up somebody. So I went aggressive in labor where I need to find one or two more starters in the outfield. And so I spent $11 out of 100 on Akil Badu. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I, and what's interesting is the way that my, my roster is now, I made a couple of big bets in, um, in free agency, like Akil Badu, and I think I got Brent Rooker too. Um, and then my bench now is Alex Kirilov, DJ Stewart, um, you know, some guys with some upside that may come in and be my free agency acquisitions later, you know, for free. So that's what I'm hoping is that I buy some, some, I find some starters in the meantime. And when those guys come back, they either give me depth to trade or they replace uh, my failed attempts at finding a starter. <laughs> uh, so I bought Logan Allen in that league for $13. Yeah. That's a pretty aggressive opening weekend. I just used a quarter of my uh, free agency auction budgets and I, and I did it with wise wide open and just knowing that if these things work out, everything goes better for my team the rest of the year. Yeah. I, I think that's the right way to go. I mean, and that would, auction was a few weeks ago. So you, you have a few more viable options available this week and there will be most weeks with it being an yeah. only league. Uh, I had a similar situation at Luis Campusano. I still haven't seen the official word if he's going to open the year uh, on the roster because they haven't made a call yet on uh, Austin Nola. But I figured I had a zero with Kiebert Ruiz. I'll throw a couple bucks at Campusano. Worst case scenario, I'm still taking a zero, but I got a guy that if he comes up, might be just as good, if not a better hitter than Kiebert Ruiz. And he's probably going to play more than Ruiz unless it's Will Smith who gets hurt. And then Justin Williams was kind of my equivalent uh, to your hitter pickup to Badu. I, I threw five at Williams because it's a little more temporary with him. With Badu, I think they could make him a bigger part of their plan. With Williams, I think he's the guy that kind of wins short term with Harrison Bader's injury. So with Williams, I mean, there was some prospect hype a few years ago during his time with the Rays. I think the best we saw from him in the upper levels of the minor leagues, 145 WRC plus as a 21 year old in 2017. Uh, let's see, we had a 152 in 2019 at AAA. I mean, that was super happy fun ball, 25% K rate. So there might be some swing and miss, but stranger things have happened. He's still young enough where there might actually be something there. And they're woefully thin in the outfield in St. Louis. It's, uh, it's actually kind of sad in some ways how bad their options are. So I'm just kind of hoping to get a month's worth of big side platoon playing time. And if he holds his own, he's easily worth 5% of the fab budget. Well, I, I just did a, my bold predictions came out today. And one of them was that the uh, Cardinals corner outfield wouldn't be uh, among the worst in baseball. There we go. I, I need that to come through now. We'll given see uh, about that. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> pretty bold. Uh, one thing. Yeah. One thing that uh, sticks out about Williams is that we are missing crucial information uh, with him. 2020, I think would be super crucial in his timeline um, to understand his growth as a, as a player, I think, because what we've seen over time is uh, more swing and miss. He's added more swing and miss and more power. Um, and it would just feel better to see one more year with an ISO that started with the two in the minor leagues, you know? Yep. Um, because you, you don't want what the projections say is going to happen, which is a 28% K rate or 26% K rate and a, and a 140 ISO. That, that will be a bad outcome. But there's definitely uh, a chance that he has league average power. And if he does, everything looks better. And non-zero chance that he carves out regular playing time. Right. Big side platoon you know, this is, is one of those chances. Fingers crossed. That's what I'm hoping for. But we'll see if that that yeah. actually happens. O'Neill's O'Ne Bader, O'Neill, Bader, and Carlson, right? Are all righties. Believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Carlson's the only one I'm not sure of right, right in my head right away, but I think so. I think they're all righties. So being the best lefty bench bat will I think will get him to four or five hundred plate appearances if he if he if he starts out well. It's all about this first week or two. But I think that's the same thing with Badu, right? I mean I'm not I'm not saying that I think he's amazing because I, I have my eyes wide open when it comes to his projections. Um, and but he's a left hander. He's supposed to strike out too much, but he didn't strike out that much this spring. 
which is just a tiny bit of signal, I think. Uh, didn't strike out that much of string, has a good eye at the plate, is kind of a five-tooler, possible. And I don't really respect any of the Tigers outfielders. That's so mean when it comes out that way. It is pretty mean. You no, know, I respect them as they're professional baseball players who are better than 95% of the people who play baseball. They're just not better than the other 5%. Well, yeah. Jacoby, <laughs> Jacoby, Jacoby Jones doesn't have to be part of their long-term plan. Like there's, there's no, there's no real reason that you have to keep. And even if you him. just play him, there's no real reason to play anybody else. I guess Grossman, you're paying, but he could be a fourth outfielder. He's not making that much. Yeah. yeah I think he could beat out Jones. Honestly, that's why, that's why I put that money down. Um, so, and then Mazzara, uh, there's like on a one year deal with him. And, I think we've seen three teams quit on Mazzara. Yep. Yeah, if he uh, slubs badly enough, he gets quit on midseason. He gets quit yeah. on in May. Like that's that's now in his range of outcomes. Like I still think he could be an above average hitter. He's not a good defender, but I think he could be a decent hitter. This is kind of his last chance to really prove it. But yeah, um, his range of outcomes now includes being released because they find other players they want to put on the field instead because that's where the do. Tigers are at. Yeah, yeah, and Badu is absolutely one of them. And they're going to be one more crowded on the infield eventually with Isaac Paredes. He's in the minors right now, too. I think he's a guy that's going to play in the big leagues for a long stretch this year. So how they make the pieces fit, I don't know. But they're going to keep skewing younger because they want to see who of that younger core is actually going to be a part of the next great Tigers team. Dinner time can be chaotic, but with Freshly, it's easy. Their chefs take care of your meals for a few nights a week and take the pressure off of you. Freshly offers chef-made, nutrient-packed, delicious meals delivered fresh to your door. No cooking required. Grocery shopping and cooking can be a pain, especially right now with Freshly. You don't have to do it. Your meals arrive cooked and fresh every week, so you can keep your fridge stocked and skip the trip to the store. Ordering is easy. Visit Freshly.com and choose from over 30 delicious, satisfying, better-for-you meals like steak peppercorn, sausage baked penne, or their chicken pesto bowl. Freshly can fit your lifestyle with a variety of plans and meals to pick from that work for your dietary needs, preferences, tastes, and family size. Right now, Freshly is offering our listeners $40 off your first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash rates. Stop stressing about dinner. Go to Freshly.com slash rates for $40 off your first two orders. That's Freshly.com slash rates for $40 off your first two orders. Stressed out and can't relax? Take an Eagle Moon Hemp CBD gummy to unwind. Use the code ATHLETIC for 30% off CBD site-wide at eaglemoonhemp.com slash shop. They already have the best prices online and in stores. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on these discounts. That's 30% off site-wide at eaglemoonhemp.com slash shop. All Eagle Moon Hemp products are vegan, low sugar, use organic practices, and are made from award-winning crop. And just in case you didn't know, CBD is not marijuana. It does not get you high. CBD may help to relieve pain, nausea, seizures, anxiety, and depression. Get 30% off all CBD products site-wide at eaglemoonhemp.com with the promo code ATHLETIC. Their products are pure, proven, lab-tested, and superior to other CBD on the market. And the best part is, they're way less in price. Throw the discount code in, and you're practically getting a product for free. That's eaglemoonhemp.com with the promo code ATHLETIC. Try them out while winning free products. Just go to their Facebook page and leave a review, or follow them on Instagram. A winner is chosen each week and sent a free product. Check them out and let us know how you like them. That's eaglemoonhemp.com with the promo code ATHLETIC. All right, you know, so I wanted to ask you about this Reds co-closer situation because teams have been hinting at some of this throughout the spring. We've been wondering how some of the timeshares might work. And this one could be pretty clear because you've got Amir Garrett and Lucas Sims, a lefty and a righty. If you think about the way the matchups could play out, a near even split doesn't seem impossible here. So my question for you is, are co-closers more viable than we realize from a fantasy perspective if it's a plan that a team like this will actually stick to? I mean, if you've looked at projections um, for relievers, which I think sometimes is problematic just because it's problematic to project a reliever at all. And then you're, you have to make this decision about how many saves to give them. And that just becomes their value right? <laughs> like if, in the, in the auction calculator or whatever, it's all about how many saves they get. But if you look 
for years and years, guys with no saves will pop as having $5 or $10 of value, you know? Um, this was like pre-saves hater and pre-saves Williams and stuff like that. You know, like even Devin, Devin Williams this year, if you give him zero saves, we'll still project to have like $7 value. But we ignore that because we want to win saves. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, we just ignore that value for the most part. Some people, some players uh, take advantage of it. Um, but I think we we're all chasing saves to the most extent. So if you give me a guy that I would project to have some value without saves, and now you tell me he'll probably get like 10 saves. There's some people who say, ah, 10 saves, that doesn't help me. Well, it's 10 saves plus like a 230 ERA plus 14 strikeouts per nine. Can, can you handle that now? So uh, yeah, I, I have some shares of Sims. Um, I've had them for a while. Cincinnati, Cincinnati is number one in fastball spin rate in the big leagues. And that happened in like two years out of nowhere. And uh, Sims is part of that. So spin it, baby. Uh, I don't know if Antone is going to figure in. I actually think that Antone is headed towards the starting rotation. I think there's a need there. And I think this bullpen thing early in the season is just about innings and health. You know, he was he was a bit little banged up in the spring training. So I'm just looking at the ATC projections for saves right now, and 11 saves gets you inside the top 30 in terms of save projections. So a 30-10 split would put one guy in the top five range, you know, and then the 10 guy would be almost in the back of the 30. So that's not bad at all. And that's all. just on saves. Why don't you do? Why don't you uh, sort relievers for uh, au- for auction value? And give us some that have zero saves. Yeah, that's... Uh, What's the value on some of those guys? That's a good call. We'll run a 12-teamer, ATC, and let's see here. Zero saves, top-valued relievers, or zero save value, I guess it would be. But like eyeball is here. James Karinchak is projected for saves, so I can't call him a zero saves guy yet. But Devin Williams, okay, Devin Williams is worth seven bucks based on the default. Seven bucks, ah, I nailed it. Yeah. I nailed it. It's seven bucks. Almost like you spent some time with that tool. Uh, so Sims, so Sims, you'd want to give Sims like a seven dollar projection, man. Oh my God, Sims is as valuable as Devin Williams. I mean. Not in the real life sense, probably, but maybe, and uh, and in a fantasy sense. Uh, you give him a few more saves, but you also give Williams a few saves, I bet. I think Williams gets something because his projected save dollar value is zero and Chad Green is negative 1.4. And I'm guessing Chad Green might be zero and that'd be right. the, the value for zero. Chad Green's a $3 guy. Even with there you the go, $3 out of with zero saves. Trevor May is um, a, a $2.6 guy with negative save value. Yeah, yeah. I, but I have no, I have no Trevor May share, so I can't say that I'm brilliant and I figured this out and I do it. <laughs> I chase saves like the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, you still could probably get Trevor May for a dollar this weekend because people aren't going to think about him unless, well, unless Edwin Diaz goes full gas can in the first four days, which is absolutely possible, even though he's really good. It's the most frustrating thing in the world with Edwin Diaz. I can't imagine even being a Mets fan because you're like, this guy should be so one good. of the lowest. One of the lowest command scores, uh, uh, even among relievers. He's one of the lowest command scores, period. Edwin Diaz is in the bottom, I think, five. So the volatility is backed up by the command number in that case. But uh, to put a a tidy answer on it, yes, co-closers can work because of the way saves are actually distributed. And I think Garrett and Sims If they're all good. Yeah. I mean, like co-closers in Chicago. I I mean, not in Chicago, in Colorado. Colorado. Uh, Daniel Bard's been good again this spring. Maybe we're underselling Bard a little bit, but you know where there's a bad situation is Arizona. Stefan Crichton, no thanks. Yeah, none of those pitchers are that good. Soria at this stage, no. Like They have to go to one of their younger really. guys. They have to go to John Duplantier Ginkle. at some point, or J.B. Bacoskis. Ginkle. Ginkle. Ginkle could be a bridge, but it, it's somebody that they option down. You're not feeling my Ginkle down. yelling, are you? No. You're like, shut up, you know? No, no Ginkle. No, no Ginkle. <laughs> I don't know why that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> <All right. laughs> so hopefully the fact that co-closers can work helps you with leagues where you're either picking up players or still drafting over the course of this week. Uh, one other thing I did 
this weekend. I, I signed up for a main event qualifier on Saturday. I tried to play the auction championship with Ian Khan, and it didn't fill. I was doing the online one with Ian. I think it only got to five or six teams out of 15, so of course it was canceled. I jumped into a main event qualifier for next year, 15-team mixed league, and my goodness, the closer runs have gotten worse, so be aware of that if you haven't drafted already. There was a stretch at picks 47 through 50 where the first four closers went. It went Hendricks, Hayter, Chapman, Diaz, all in the early part of round four of that league. So I'm not saying you have to necessarily also overpay for closers, but in leagues like that where you have to get some saves, less important in a qualifier because you could punt a category. There's no overall component. Have some plans in place if things get wonky with saves. Presley, they're getting Iglesias, Cambrill. I think you could... They're going up too. Presley and Iglesias are 75 and 80 overall in drafts right now. But I think you could... If you... If if your value sheet says like pick hater, pick hater, do it. Um, and I think that's fine. And I like those top four. And if you if you think that's a value where that is, that's fine. There is also the strategy of if I'm lucky enough to pick the last of those four, like if I happen to be within reach, that's why all those they went like that. Because someone's like, Oh, okay, well, we've set the we've set the the ceiling with hater. You know, now these next three, these next three closers are close enough to Hater that they're all going to go bing, bang, bang, and and they, and so you could be lucky enough to be part of that run right? <laughs> where you're just like, oh, some guy three ahead of me took Hater, time to take Chapman, you know. Um, but if you're not, I think you can wait a round or two and then make sure that you're part of the Presley Iglesias Kimbrel uh, run because I see those guys as kind of the next tier down. And um, you could try the double tap in there. Um, and that's where some of my better bullpens lo- have like a Presley Kimbrell beginning. I feel okay about that. I ended up in that league. I was picking from the fourth spot. I ended up with Kenley Jansen in the seventh, which is surprising to people who listen to this pod because I think we've been afraid of Kenley Jansen for a year and a half now. Mm-hmm. And Jordan Romano in the 10th. That's where Jordan Romano goes. He goes in the 10th. So, you Who's know, your, we'll see. Do you have a, did you try a third, a third closer? Yeah, I took a couple your... very late darts in that league. Ended up with Gregory Soto nice. in the 25th. Soto. Yeah, one of your guys. And that was my only one for now. But I've got a few potential closers in waiting, maybe lined up for this weekend's pickups. Just I bought case. a couple of shares of Alvarado and free agency in the first time through. Yeah, uh, I would say that's not a great bullpen. <laughs> but but you didn't spend the same prices as everybody else. Right. I've got an advantage in hitting, and that draft started DeGrom Bueller, so I've got plenty of starting pitching. So I think, I think it could work because there's no overall component. If the saves go completely sideways and I can't find somebody on the wire, I can win the other categories and still potentially win the league. But uh, the thing I wanted to pass along to people that I found really helpful, and I've done this before, but it Doing it more than once, I think, has helped realize how important and how valuable this can be. I sat down with the most recent ADP prior to the draft on Saturday afternoon. I ran it back just for, I think, three days worth of drafts, filtered down to 15 team leagues to make sure that I was looking at similar drafts. There's enough volume right now where you could do this with the NFBC ADP report. And I looked through on the draft grid view to see what was happening at my pick. For every single turn, I was looking at who was going just before my turn, who was going at my turn, who was going just after. And I was kind of scribbling down notes on a big pad of paper for the first 10 rounds. You could do this for all 30 rounds if you want to. I don't think it's a bad idea to go further than 10, but 10 at least gets you the foundation. And I wanted to make sure that the most likely problems that would come up were all problems I'd thought about before the draft started. So that way, when the pick clock hit me with one minute, I wasn't panicking. I had players that were in each spot that I expected to be there. And I kind of had the, the A the thread, the B thread, and the C thread. Like, oh, if I've got pitching early, I'm going with these hitters. If I need pitching here because i got hitters, these are the pitchers I'm looking at. If I'm getting close, And these are the early, likely names so that I'm not like searching through the queue trying to queue some players up. And, and, and when you're searching and you don't have those names already in, in your head, then you're going to be, uh, I think, too affected by ADP. Because ADP is how those players come up in the queue, right? So if you're searching for names, you're just going to search for the names that are at the top there. And you're not going to think of someone who's 100 or 50 lower in ADP 
uh, b- because you haven't thought it ahead, ahead of time. But if you were looking at the value sheet and you're looking at ADP, you'll have like three or four names for each for each round. Yeah, I love that. And these drafts flow like according to chalk a lot. Mm-hmm. So I'm I I wouldn't be surprised if you told me right now that uh, a lot of times it was exactly the names you'd written down. There was no exactly. point. There was no point at which I was surprised by a name. The only time I okay, so I have my my list is right here. It looks it's ridiculous. My handwriting's terrible. <laughs> so that's nice. what it looks like. That, that's my it's my organized chaos. This is how I I want a league potentially on Saturday. The only player who wasn't previously written down where I took him was Kenley. And that was a problem that I at least thought about. I'm like, well, what happens if saves are goofy early, mm-hmm. right? It just, everybody else I had placed either in the round I took them or right near the round where I took that player. And usually I got the player mm-hmm. around later too. So that was, that was great. So I had everything lined up really well. So I would highly recommend doing that because it also gives you players to put in the queue. So like Eno was saying, the room usually sorts by ADP or overall rank, depending on where you're playing. It sorts by a default something. And people who don't do a lot of prep are going to gravitate toward the players on the top of the list. It's just what your brain is going to do, especially when there's a timer telling you you have to hurry. If you have the players targeted already, you can go through, search them, star them, put them in the queue in between your turns, and just kind of wait and see and go, okay, I'm seven picks away from my turn. I still have four of my targets left. I should start thinking now with a few minutes on the clock for these other people, what happens if all four of these people are gone? What mm-hmm. part of my plan am I going to go to? Check my sheet, look ahead to my next round, look and see who maybe fell. Like It's just, it's a way to organize the chaos. And I, I realize my doctor-esque handwriting for someone who has no chance of being a physician is truly chaotic in its own sense. But it works for me. I'm telling you, like this, it's a way to just gather your thoughts. Did you spend any time going, who is this name I wrote down? I have, okay. I will admit this to you because you're my friend. <laughs> Nobody else is listening. Do not tell Steph this. I write <laughs> things down somewhat regularly that I cannot identify. <laughs> I, I deny this at home all the time. I will scribble down a grocery list or I'll scribble down a note. You're and at the store. What I'm is at the this? store. And I'm like, uh, and I, have to, I have to pretend like that doesn't happen here because I'm accused <laughs> of that often. And if that's true, that means I have to like sit down with a penmanship book and like learn how <laughs> to, to improve write my correctly. <laughs> and I really, I just don't want to do that. I, I, I think it would be good for me, but I just don't want to do it. So I'm admitting <laughs> it. I have written stuff down and not been able to read it like 10 seconds later. <laughs> I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to slow down, but not in March. So, all right, got that off my chest. I feel uh, quite a bit better, uh, but I do feel really good about the team. And again, not being surprised by anything uh, is always a, a nice way to go. If you can map it out that much, you will feel so much more comfortable in the moment. No one's perfect. Even the best baseball players strike out with the bases loaded. The best golfers sometimes three putt with a tournament on the line. So if you feel like you come up short in the bedroom sometimes, it's perfectly okay. And if it's bothering you, there are options. Go to GetRoman.com slash rates. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for ED, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. A U.S. licensed healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan. And if a medication is appropriate, it ships to you free with two-day shipping. The whole process is straightforward and discreet. Getting started is easy. Just go to GetRoman.com slash rates and complete an online visit. Taking care of your ED without leaving home is easy to do. Complete an online visit today to connect with the doctor and take care of it. Go to GetRoman.com slash rates to get $15 off your first month. Look, there's a straightforward way to take care of your ED. Go to GetRoman.com slash rates. Get started now to save $15 on your first month of treatment. And of course, we are now deep into March Madness. Listeners of this show know exactly what that means. It is time to get some bets in. And you got opening day just around the corner, so you want to get some futures in for that as well. At The Athletic, our team of experts and insiders are bringing you all the latest news, trends, and insights on the big dance, plus our picks for every single game on the slate in Indy. Me, honestly, I'm moving on to baseball season. I hate to do it, but I still like the Astros to win the World Series. I think the odds are actually really good if you want to put some money down on Houston 
And now we're partnering with BetMGM to bring you the best exclusive offer to bet alongside us and win. Right now, we're offering Rates and Barrels listeners a risk-free first bet up to $600. Just sign up at BetMGM.com. Use the bonus code RATES to take advantage of this special offer from the King of Sportsbooks. This offer is for new customers. That's a risk-free first bet up to $600 at BetMGM.com with the bonus code RATES. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Nevada, and Virginia. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa and Tennessee. Call or text the red line 800 889 9789. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1 800 9 with it in Indiana. Promotional offer not available in Nevada. And finally, throughout the men's tournament, the Athletics College basketball crew is bringing you the Ding You presented by Bet MGM. We're going to cover all the action both on the court and at the sports book, grabbing insight from the Athletics College basketball writers and picking the brain of Bet MGM's top bookmakers. Check out the show on the Daily Ding podcast feed and streaming on YouTube. All right, we close out with some first week planning thoughts. Uh, a couple things I've noticed. I brought this up on the other shows already. But Logan Webb's April schedule is really nice. I think that was driving some of the bidding on him uh, overnight on Sunday. If he's still available in your league, look at the matchups. It's a good one to start against Seattle. He's got Colorado at home next week, but the whole month really stacks up nice. Kind of the opposite of what's happening in Arizona. I don't think I want to throw any Arizona pitchers until April's over based on their schedule. So I'm definitely looking at the whole month now that the pieces are starting to come together, you know. But I also had a, a broad question that was on my mind throughout the weekend. How should we identify the teams that we want to stream against this early in the season? Some of them are obvious. Pittsburgh, okay, that's low-hanging fruit. Colorado outside of Coors, sure, we can all get that. But the list is more than two teams deep. So how do you choose which teams you're going to take those chances against as the season begins? Uh, yeah, I think the answer is projections. And I think the answer is projections for longer than we think. Um, you know, there'll be a team that scores a few, like what if Pittsburgh, you know, scores a few runs this first, uh, this first series uh, for whatever reason, I don't think we should actually change our appraisal of them as a team that much uh, based on that. So uh, you can go over to the projected standings at Fangraphs and just sort by runs scored per game. Yankees, Blue Jays, Astros, Twins, Dodgers, Red Sox. Uh, but then also the Angels are up there with the Braves and Nationals as teams that will score a lot. Um, but uh, teams you want to uh, play against, Pirates, Marlins, Giants, Cardinals, Mariners. Yeah, it's interesting that the Mariners are there. I... I uh, I picked Arietta over Webb as a streamer because uh, of the AL and the DH. That's Maybe fair. I made a mistake. Well, I think I think when you see it, this is probably the best way to quantify it is to look at the, the runs scored per game projections. And the Pirates and Marlins are kind of in a class of their own. And the Giants exceeded expectations last year. So I think if you're still thinking about what we were doing at the end of last season, the Giants were playing to that level where you're saying, oh, should we be streaming against them anymore? Mm -hmm. My argument is that you should stream against them again. They're still rebuilding. They still have plenty of flaws. That's a lineup that doesn't have a lot of depth. Like, Take as many shots as you want against the Giants with pitching. Chris Flexen is streamable. I tweeted this on Sunday. I have no idea if I want Chris Flexen on my roster beyond the weekend, but I do want him on my roster for this weekend because I do think with the Giants being projected as the third lowest scoring team in the league, that's a good spot for almost any starting pitcher. As long as you think that pitcher has a shot to go five and put themselves in position for a win, you should take that chance. Yeah, I, I think, I guess so. I did a piece with Andrew Baggerly about that. Um, one of the best, one of the biggest, it was like the top three turnaround in uh, team offense season to season. Uh, last year was the, the Giants. And there's definitely some process stuff that's going on there where they, they've they improved their coaching process and their um, the, the way that they sort of try to get the most out of their players. But at the same time, like a lot of the bounce back was from Brandon Belt and Brandon Crawford, who, you know, are decidedly post-peak. You would expect them to regress back again the other way uh, this season. So, uh, and, and just, just in general, 
there's like one pre-peak bat in that lineup, Dubon, mm-hmm. and his peak is not considered to be that exciting. No, so he might be I, I at think, peak already. He might like right. he might be there now. So that's that's part of the yeah. problem for me. Yeah, yeah. And Yaz is a good bat, and and they've they. I think one thing they did was they collected a bunch of post peak bats because they were easily collected. <laughs> <You know>? mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like it's pretty easy to pick up a Donovan Solano. Like yeah, he he ended up being pretty good in the major leagues. He's probably going to regress some, and he also has no sort of dynasty type value. He has no like long term value really because he had like thousands and thousands of plate appearances in the minor leagues. It's like. Uh, congratulations, you put together a credible offense, but like in terms of long-term assets, what do they come up with? Dubon is more like, I still think, a utility guy. I would agree. So they haven't yet produced uh, the next bats. I guess I'm waiting for Ramos. Yeah. Well, he might be up June, maybe. It's possible. I think they want to give him a shot sooner rather than later. Let that development He's better than his projections, I'm pretty sure good one to file away for a possible future pickup this season at the other end of the spectrum teams to fear the Yankees projected for five and a half runs per game nothing new there how about Toronto jumping up there almost 5.4 runs per game they weren't at that level before twins Astros you expect them to be there Red Sox right there with the Dodgers I, I think I've seen them that way I don't know if everybody universally has seen them that way it just kind of feels like the way they're viewed has slipped a bit since the bets trade but they're still an offense that you got to be careful with uh, I would say the angels the Red and Sox, Braves I think too. are actually a decent if we're talking better MGM side, type situation like I think I keep circling around the Red Sox as a decent um win win total bet and over I think yeah, yeah I think that people are sleeping on them. Uh, you know, when Chris Sale comes back, there's a chance where they might have a rotation of five credible arms, you know, um, Possible. and, and the offense in the meantime, I don't think it's taken that much of a step back. So I think the hardest team to figure out right now from a streaming against them standpoint is the Padres because the offense is projected to be good. We like what they're doing. They're projected to be the 11th highest scoring team, which when you put them in their own ballpark kind of makes them a team that you could still throw at least your mid-range starters against. I think what I'm bringing up here is I don't think you necessarily have to panic when you see an at San Diego matchup, even though that team is good. It's it's not the layup it used to be where you just play everybody in San Diego, but I don't think you have to cut the starters off quite as early as you think when it comes to pitching certain guys in that ballpark against that lineup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I'm I'm really interested in how Merrill Kelly does against them this weekend. I think that's a great one. The, that's a great like that's a great first example. Like in a 15, I see the velo on Kelly. I want to see I want to see how the Padres lineup does. Also, I wonder you know the nice that Tatis is out. Is this Padres lineup take a big hit? Yeah, if if he is, he's being a home run like. Friday, right? He came back and home. I think he's, I think he's in, but I think they'll also sit him some nights. So there'll yeah. be like some sort of emergency situations where the Padres are suddenly like, like fairly pitched. You can pitch to them. Right. Yeah. If you take Tatis out, that probably pulls that number down a little closer to the league Grisham average in hurt. terms of runs scored. Grisham is hurt. He's dinged. Yep. I think he might not make opening day. Yeah. That's possible at this point. I mean, they're a good team. They've got great depth. I'm just saying, don't. Yeah, and, and you also have to put them it. in the context of the National League, dude. I mean, 11th overall, but there's a lot of DH, you know, American League ahead of them. In terms of the National League, the only teams ahead of them are the Dodgers, the Braves, and the Nationals. Mm-hmm. And the Nationals so are fourth barely best. ahead of them. Yeah, and honestly, I'm surprised by that. I think that's still like a good that, offense. Yeah. yeah. But- Bell and Schwarber, I think we're good additions there. I mean, they're both they're both getting big park upgrades. That's the thing I kept coming back to as I look at them throughout draft season. I felt like they they could just bounce back in part because their environment was now more conducive to big power. Uh, Harrison's nailed- Josh Harrison's projections are not that good though. I don't know what I'm they're a little doing surprised base. that they're just going with Josh Harrison, but I think. Luis Garcia is going to come up and just play good defense at second base in a few weeks. I don't think they're going to hold with Harrison there very long. Uh, one mailbag question here before we go. This one comes from Ryan. 
I'd love to hear your thoughts about Shelby Miller's comeback attempt. His velocity looks good, and the slider looks like a real weapon in the game that I watched. He didn't make the team out of spring training. He has an April opt-out, so I expect him to be back soon. Maybe they're stretching him out at the alternate site before recalling him. Shelby has me thinking of other comeback players like Wade Davis. Maybe you guys could highlight some comeback attempts you think are worth tracking when the real game starts. So let's just take Miller first. Do you think there's anything left in the tank with Shelby Miller? I mean, we've seen most recently, I think, Daniel Bard, who I mentioned a little earlier, that was the most amazing comeback we've seen maybe in the last 10 years. The guy that was gone for a long time came back and pitched at a high level in Colorado. But uh, Shelby Miller still hanging around the Cubs organization. Do you think we see him give them meaningful innings this year? I hate to plead ignorance, but I just don't have uh, I don't have any velocity numbers. I, that's the number one thing I want to know. It just describes their their upside and their their health and um, you know, one thing that we did see um, as Miller uh, left the league the first time was um, actually the velocity was still good till the end. Uh, the big thing was he just lost all command. He couldn't repeat at all with his mechanics. Yeah, I guess that's uh, that's interesting. That he, I think he becomes interesting. A uh, guy who could uh, do like a uh, maybe like a four ERA with a one three whip and eight strikeouts per nine, maybe a little bit more. Always had a good breaking ball. Um, I I'd, I'd be interested. It, I there it has there is some crowd there though. If you want him to be a starter, he now has to overcome Mills and Williams. Yeah, Williams ended up in the rotation for now. Elzale is in there for now. Yeah. So it, it it's going to be tricky. I wonder if they would bring him up as a multi-inning reliever, though. And, and I think that's a chance to possibly get him back on track. I mean, like it doesn't have to be as a starter necessarily, but it also wouldn't be exciting from a fantasy perspective if he gets back. As much as it'd be cool to see Shelby Miller get his career back on track in whatever way he can, I don't know if he's going to pitch his way back to even deep league fantasy relevance this year. But I think you're right. I think not knowing velo readings is making speculating on these situations particularly difficult. Yeah, let me see here. I want to see how many innings he threw. He had at least seven. 12. Yeah, up to, up to 12? Okay. I was going to say, I just saw yeah. a tweet from about a couple weeks ago where he had seven already. So they're treating him like a starter. 16 strikeouts in 12 innings with six walks, though. That's not, that's that, that kind of almost sounds like the Miller that we last saw, which was, you know, still some velo, still some, some stuff, but no command. Yeah. I was trying to think if I thought, saw any other names this spring that surprised me as much as Bard did this time a year ago. I think it was our, our friend Rob Silver who literally just tweeted something like that Daniel Bard when the Rockies mentioned that they signed him uh, over a year ago. And hey, look, they, they got that one right. So, uh, hats off to him for that bounce back. But I like Rafael Dolis wasn't a guy that I was on last spring at all. I, I didn't think he was going to come back and, and have a prominent role. I think Matt Moore, his return from overseas has been discussed Josh Harrison. a little bit on our show. Harrison, maybe, but I, I'm not a Harrison believer. I never really was on, on Harrison. I always kind of wondered what the Pirates saw and why they kept pushing him out there as much as they did a few years ago. Mm. Who else? Who else has been buried and forgotten about? Yeah, I no one no one struck my no one caught my eye this spring. If that uh, if that provides any clarity, it doesn't mean they're not there. But uh, I mean, like, and I was trying to think of some. I remember there's one name that Jake McGee came back last year too. That was a pretty nice bounce back. It happens. I just feel yeah. like it happens so much more often in the bullpen. Yeah. It's definitely more in the bullpen. And that's where I think if Miller makes an impact this year, it could be in the bullpen. You know, uh, Kimbrell has some collapsibility. And there's not, I mean, Wick is uh, pretty good, but I think he's hurt right now. Um, and so, you know, I guess it's, today is the day of bold predictions. If there's, here's a bold prediction. Five saves for Shelby Miller. <laughs> uh, I thought that, that I, I saw a veteran make... 
<laughs> I do. I do. It's it's almost in my contract. Um, you know, Daniel Hudson. Ow. Oh, ouch. Is that appropriate? <laughs> I don't know what just happened right there. Uh, a mic Everything hit. just fell apart. I, I said Daniel Hudson. Yeah, I hurt. And then I hit my elbow. Uh, well, this last uh, Rotowire no- new note is not that great for Hudson, but I think he's going to make that team. And uh, as much as I think Tanner Rainey is next in line, uh, they could go with the veteran if Brad Hand, uh, cont- his peripherals continue to decline and it affects his overall numbers. All right, I got, I got a comeback player on the hitter side. Matt Duffy. Matt mm-hmm. Duffy made the Cubs. I oh, think Matt Duffy is a decent bench Cubs. player. Yeah, I think he's a decent bench player. I don't think he's all that exciting for our purposes, but a guy that you know we cared about a few years took ago. Took Nico Harner's job. He's been hurt a lot. Yeah, and David Bodie is the starter. That means it. Yes, it does. Oh, I think I missed a chance. Hmm. I'm gonna, Did you? When this is over, I'm going to furiously search for David Bodie shares. Well, you still got one more draft that somehow, you got to get to. So somehow I saw Nico Horner was demoted, and the the it didn't click in my brain to go running trying to get, pick up Bodie. Yeah, no, well, he's he's got that opportunity. Myself, yeah. Always time to make it right. Oh, the other name that I saw, Scott Casimir. He's mm-hmm. um, headed to AAA. It appears for the Giants, but they're injury prone enough and desperate enough for innings that could happen over the course of the season. Um, I don't think Aaron Sanchez was gone gone long enough to count as part of this, but Scott Casimir, if he comes back at age 37 and gives the Giants some useful innings, that's a pretty cool story. Yeah, yeah, he's a nice guy, and he's a he's he's trying he's trying man he's trying to hold on to the dream. Um, I can you know one thing that I think of sometimes when I see a lefty like that is Oliver Perez, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and Casimir doesn't have like the same mechanics or anything um, and loogies are going away but um if there's any sort of question about velo if puck sort of establishes himself as a as a starter i think there could be a use for casimir as a lefty in the pen yeah so deep 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 possible sleeper not necessarily for fantasy but just for a guy trying to get back the last time we saw scott casimir in the big leagues it was 2016 with the dodgers made 26 starts that year had a 456 ERA, 136 whip. Uh, every time you mention Oliver Perez or anyone mentions Oliver Perez, I think back to the early, early part of his career in Pittsburgh. I thought he was going to be really, really good early in his career. Uh, even though the control was a major issue, the strikeouts were pretty consistently there. And you know, with the Mets, we saw some pretty big strikeout totals. But one of the last guys I can remember seeing getting over 100 strikeouts but also walking more than 100 guys in the same season. That was back in 2008 with the Mets. 180 Ks against 105 walks. That is very hard to do because it is very hard to stay in a rotation when you walk that many guys. He has some walk totals of start with eight. Some walk rates that start with eight. Yeah, rare. Very, very rare. Mm. On that note, I think that is going to wrap up today's show. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. Drop us a line, of course, at ratesandbarrels at theathletic.com if you prefer email. And if you're still listening here and would like to get in on a great subscription deal, $1 a month at theathletic.com slash ratesandbarrels. Gets you rankings, Eno's bold prediction pieces, everything he writes, everything I write, rankings, all the stuff we do site-wide, $1 a month to start. It's the best deal that we do all year. For Eno Saris, I'm Derek Van Riper. We are back with you on Wednesday. Thanks for listening.